Good afternoon. It is Wednesday, March the 24th, and the timing of this conversation is, is particularly pertinent, is it not? As today was initially classed as the day we hope to be exiting lockdown. There's no doubt the, the COVID-19 pandemic is having an impact on, on everyone's lives, but realistically, with at least another fortnight under the current measures, how are you getting on? You may be bored, fed up, frustrated. You may be enjoying a more laid-back way of life, but what of those of you who are really struggling, who are, are feeling low, lonely, anxious, depressed, very different things, of course, concerned about your health or, or that of those close to you. Well, here to hopefully help and allay some of those concerns today to discuss that most precious of assets, our emotional health and well-being, are the head of mental health in the Isle of Man, Ross Bailey, and on Zoom from the Isle of Listen charity, the consultant clinical psychologist, Professor Robin Davison, and child and adolescent psychotherapist Lindsay Christian. Good afternoon, one and all. Uh, thank you for, for your time. Um, and let us be honest, areas of mental health, the mental health service are overstretched and, and overfunded even before COVID reared its head. So there, there are quite a few issues I, I want to tackle and explore with you in a, in a moment, Ross Bailey. But, but um, let, let me um, start with you, Lindsay, for, for any parents watching this, if I may, because I've witnessed it in recent weeks, and I'm sure a number of people have, children and young people really struggling. Physical and mental health are very closely linked, of course. J just to start us off, how can parents talk to their children about coronavirus without making them anxious? Good afternoon, Ross. So I think the main, the main thing really at the moment is for parents to have open conversations with their with their children, um, regardless of age, and I think it's really important that, that people and um, parents do have age appropriate conversations with their children. So it's really about gauging what information your children need to know. So it's it's about keeping the information concise and factual, but not overwhelming a child, and um, so they don't take on those those real worries or concerns. Um, but I do think it's important that children are kept up to date um, on, on information about what's happening, especially on the island in terms of the government res restrictions um, and, and what their day to day life looks like. But it really is important that, that parents gauge at a right level. So really think about your children as individuals and what information is appropriate for them to know and be very much led by your children. So if a child is asking questions, try and ask the, answer those questions in a really open and, and honest way. Are, are you actually hearing and, and, and witnessing indeed cases where, where young people are more concerned than perhaps they normally would be this time? <laughs> Yeah, and I think I think that's understandable given the circumstances. We're in a, a very unprecedented time. Who could have imagined that just over a year ago we'd be sitting here in our third lockdown on the island? I don't think anybody would have, have really thought that. And it's it's really important to understand that actually it, regardless of how old you are, when we are in difficult times, people do struggle. Um, and that struggle usually is with our mental health. So whether you've had a pre-existing uh, mental health condition or whether you are struggling because of our current lockdown or previous lockdowns. Um, but we have we have seen probably an increase in, in people concerned with their mental health and struggling with their mental health. Um, and that's really important that we do really take that on board and, and try and support and help those people where needed. Ross, Ross Bailey, um, what are your thoughts, initial thoughts then about the, the backlash of this pandemic? Because more and more people were hearing are having anxiety mm. disorders. The, the, the CAM service, child, adolescent and mental health, in, in some areas, I think it respectfully, is hardly touching the side of the problems. There are numerous Appointments now on the phone rather than face to face. Specialist treatments are being delayed. People are waiting to get onto the system indefinitely in some cases. There is a bit of a ticking time bomb there. I'm, I'm sure you, you agree what, wherever you look. What investment is being made in the, in the mental health service for the future? For the, the, this, once coronavirus, once this pandemic, mm. however long it lasts, once this lockdown is over, what investments being made in the future of the Isle of Man's mental health service and at what level? I think it's a really good question. I mean, as, as, as I know um, Rob and I speak a little bit in terms of the evidence base, but we, we know the, the sort of certainly suggested that uh, we're going to experience a, a, another pandemic following this, and that's a, a, a mental health pandemic, the, uh, you know, the emotional well-being 
um, of, of, of the community, you know, has been significantly impacted uh, uh, by this, by this, in, by the by the current pandemic. There's a huge amount of work going on, uh, James, in terms of the, uh, the, the mental health service and um, uh, you know, how we've learnt um, from, from the current uh, model of delivery and what we can do differently um, going forward. I think one of the, you know, arguably one of the, 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 the biggest shifts really um, is a recent awarding of funding to significantly increase our access to, 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 to talking therapies. Um, so, um, certainly this year we're looking at recruiting an additional nine um, uh, therapists, which is going to make an enormous difference in terms of timely access to, 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 to NICE, um, so the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, evidence-based um, treatments. So we're looking to, to, to we're recruiting, currently recruiting now um, th those therapists and we'll be embedding those in um, primary care, so working with our GP colleagues in a much more integrated and collaborative way. We're also really looking at, at how we can work in a much more seamless way with our, with our third sector colleagues um, because they bring an enormous wealth of experience and skills um, um, to, the, to, to, to the table. So we're looking at how we, how we, can, how we can work with those, uh, with, with those services. I mean, listen, uh, I listen is, 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 is one example um, of the fantastic resources um, that are out there, but it means us working in a much more joined up um, collaborative, way, collaborative yeah. absolutely yeah. collaborative yeah. way, and filling some of those gaps that we know are there. Adding on to that, we've we've also, and this is a, a real significance for us. We're looking at um, this year. We've teamed up with our colleagues in the Department of Education, uh, Department of Education, and Chester University to train local CBT therapists, and that's a two-year program, and that's going to start in the second quarter of this year. Um, so that's looking at uh, 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 harvesting local talent on the island, given the opportunity to train as, as CBT therapists and, and, and work both within our services and the, the, the wider third sector. So that's a fantastic initiative that we're, we're enormously proud of. If money was no object, um, and I have to say, and I'm sure you agree, this issue can be far from resolved from just throwing money at it. Absolutely. Would there be an argument for having a, a crisis team, or almost a mental health A&E equivalent? Well, yeah, we do. I mean, we have we have a crisis team um, at, at the moment, that kind of acts in that capacity, dealing with. Um, but in terms uh, of twenty four seven, I mean, it's twenty four seven provision at the moment, um, James. We have we have um, it's covered twenty four seven seven days a week, and we're actually remodelling the way that crisis team um, operates and, and looking at adding a, a, a more additional staff uh, to that service. So really bolstering our response, so people making sure that people are seen and assessed in a timely fashion, and then have access to the right care pathway. If that's in place, then in that case, why are so many people of all ages falling through the cracks? Mm. Well, I think there's the, with all the will in the world, James, the, the mental health service is never going to be the answer to the mental health and emotional well-being difficulties on the island. We're a very, very important cog in the wheel, but we're absolutely a cog in the wheel. And I think that's where that collaborative approach comes in with, with our third sector colleagues. Absolutely, you know, we, we, we're in the process of investing more. Um, but we're also reliant on, on, on individual and community resilience, people working together, working, um, talking to each other, Building, taking responsibility for their own emotional well-being, and um, some of the five ways to well-being that I spoke about um, uh, last week is good examples how, of how how we can do that. We've all got a, a responsibility to look our, after our own emotional well-being. You referred it to as a, as a as a precious asset, and I don't think it is a more precious asset. So it's really important that we we, we take care of that. Well, Professor Davison, and um, if I can just bring you in at this point, I think on your website, the I Listen website, it says one in four people have mental illness uh, but the reality is that all of us have mental health i suppose so, so generally and everyone's different how can individuals even begin to 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 keep their mental health in check how can we we monitor our mental health well just let me just let me say um, ross was talking there about and I, I want to start on a positive note i mean i've worked on the island with people who have got cancer and looking at their psychological needs and how people get depressed. But one thing that always strikes me, James, is that people who have got it's not the number of people who are dealing with cancer, for example, who are depressed, but the number who aren't. The actual resilience that people can show, uh, it never ceases. It's very humbling for me. And in the six years of the Second World War, we saw that as well. And in this seemingly endless pandemic, the, it's a testimony to human resilience that 
two thirds of people, even three quarters of people report that they're doing okay mentally. Now, that means that obviously there's a quarter of people who perhaps have issues or will have issues around mainly anxiety and depression kicked in by loneliness. Loneliness is the key precipitant of all of this and, and financial difficulties. Those are the big two that cause mental health issues. So obviously some people are depressed and some people are anxious and they're different things. And we've got data to suggest that people in the beginning of the pandemic, when everybody was fight and fight and edgy and, and, and so on and scared and, and stressed, anxiety was more of an issue. But as time's gone on, that anxiety has decreased and we have noticed more depression coming in. People are kind of losing heart. They're thinking that this is going on forever. They heard Professor Whitty the other day saying there was going to be another surge at Christmas. We're hearing people saying that the social distancing might go on for years. And this, this has led to an increase in depression a little bit. There's a lifetime prevalence of depression of about 8%, 8% of people. In the latter part of this pandemic in the UK, it's kicking in at around 14, it's nearly doubled. So the issue of anxiety at the beginning of the pandemic leading into kind of a propensity to depression now among people uh, is, is concerning. And that's what I think we have to look at at the moment. And, and how then, thank you, and how, going back to the original question, then how can we as individuals keep our mental health in check? How, how do we even begin to start that process? Well, there's a lot of people, everybody says that uh, you have to exercise, you have to talk to people, you have to mitigate against loneliness, you have to set targets and all of these sorts of things. And that's fine. It's very easy to say. Sometimes it's harder to do. I think the key thing, if you're getting depressed, uh, is uh, to, f to, to search very hard to find form a structure. Depression is caused by a sense of hopelessness and loss of control. And the one thing that we do in therapy for people who are getting depressed, who are lacking in motivation, who are wearing their pyjamas all day, who, are, who just have lost an interest, is to begin to try to help them through perhaps CBT or something like that, or or self-help to gain a little bit of control back into their life and to get a structure and to get sensible aims. It's could be called behavioural activation in clinical terms, but that's what it really means. And I think that has to be the focus as the, as the pandemic moves forward into this phase that we're looking at. Ross Bailey? Yeah, I think um, and Robin made some really salient points. I think I'm, I'm sure Robin will agree and Robin, I'm sure, will expand on this how important it is that people learn to understand their own emotions and recognise um, when there's changes that might represent a deterioration in mood, Robin. Um, and and, and yeah. catch, catching that early, understanding your own, own emotions, understanding how that affects your behaviour, and then doing something about it is, is absolutely the, the, the key. And also recognising that in other people and reaching out to su su support them. Robbie might want to, to, to speak a bit more in detail about that. Well, just, just let me, you're talking about managing our, our emotions mm. here. I mean, we've often heard it decades ago, mm. sort of the, the phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones and, mm. and all that, names mm. will never hurt me. Mm. That was often the phrase that, that we used to be told by our parents to sort of ward off the, yeah. the bullies yeah. in the playground, yeah. etc. cetera. Um, and, we, and we know now mm. that those sort of unkind and, and and, and cruel utterings of, mm. of, of children and adults can, mm. can hurt deeply and, and leave scars with, with mm. some people for years. But we also know that that traditional British stoicism, the stiff yeah. upper lip yeah. approach uh, in the face of adversity, that resoluteness is, mm. is now sniggered at in some mm. quarters. So mm. when you go back and just use those two as an example, as a professional, mm. has that approach, that attitude of, of, of yesteryear left a generation or two flawed, incapable of showing emotion? Well, I think, you know, arguably, yes, I think, you know, we, we, we're not great, and particularly in, in, in the case of, uh, of men as well, I think, um, you know, that's pretty well evidence that, uh, you know, we, we, without, without stereotyping, you know, uh, men have typically found it more difficult to express their uh, emotions and reach out uh, for support. And, um, you know, and tragically, at times, that's reflected in, in, in the, 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 the suicide data. 
Um, but I, I think, you know, our ability to, to, to notice when... Um, and first of all, I think it's, you know, it, we've come on leaps and bounds in the, in the, in the last couple of decades in terms of our, our understanding uh, of mental health problems, of emotional well-being, you know, how we, how we speak more about, openly speak about our emotions more. But uh, there's still an awful long way to go, James, you know, and, and our ability to recognise shifts and changes. You know, things, for instance, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, I think it's a Greek terminology, anhedonia, which basically means a loss of interest in things that we used to find typically found interesting. You know, and that's a key symptom of, uh, of depression and something we absolutely look out for. As is this kind of self, self, you know, sense of you know, helplessness or hopelessness, you know, a lack of sleep, a loss of appetite. There's a whole multitude of, 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 of symptoms that we look out for. I and mean, if, you know, if, if we can, if we can you know, um, improve the community and public's awareness of those things, that can only be a good thing. Where, where do you strike that balance between talking about something yeah. and, in, in many ways, helping yourself before you even get to that stage? And I, and I mean this most respectfully. Uh, obviously, uh, it illustrates how time has changed, but you often heard, not so much now, you heard the, the phrase, pull yourself together mm. or, or man up. Pull your socks up. Uh, pull your socks up. Yeah. For example, for example, yeah. is it always wrong to utter phrases like that? Or, or tell me, and that's terminology from mm. day gone, days mm. gone by, but with regards to mental and emotional health, yes, times have changed, but have we become less resilient today? I, 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 I'm not sure we've become less resilient. I think the resilience is an enormous spectrum, isn't it? I, I think, you know, and that's dependent on our experiences in lives, you know, our opportunities in lives, you know, arguably our DNA. So, you know, our ability to cope, just like, you know, some people are more prone to, 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 to coughs and colds and chest infections, and others seem to sort of flip through life without it. You know, it is a huge spectrum. Uh, um, um, and when, 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 you, when you notice a shift in your own uh, resilience, when you notice that things are changing for you, that should be the trigger. And, and that self-awareness is so, so key. So, L Lindsay, sorry, yes. Um, I think a lot of the work that we do um, as part of our uh, as part of our listen is is very much around what you're saying there, James and Ross. Is around um, encouraging people to, to become aware of mental illness, about mental health, about their own mental health, about what is um, right for them, what feels right for them, when to acknowledge and understand that actually things might be changing um, for them, for, for individuals and for the people around them. Um, it's about sort of encouraging those those open conversations around mental health, um, and that's been that's really one of the the key things that we do with I Listen, and when we go into schools and we do. Um, training and teaching um, in, in, in lessons and in assemblies is very much around trying to normalise mental health and get those conversations going and get people really aware of, of, of mental health as a, you know, as a, an over an overview and also what is, what is okay for people and what's right for people and what people understand about mental health. You say schools there. I mean, I mean, never before have the words emotional well-being and, and mental health been so so used. Whether that be in in the media, in hospitals, in schools, and I, and I see next week at Ramsey Grammar School, for example, there's a, there's an initiative, um, an online mental health initiative. Lindsay, how important are initiatives like that where there is concern for early intervention? Because I, I know that that the evidence base universally asserts that that the sooner you do something about it, that the better the outcome. Absolutely, and that's that's really where I listen as a charitable initiative was really born from. Um, you know, it, it came about a couple of years ago um, that we realised that there was a place for early intervention on the island in terms of mental health with young people, um, and and that's really our our vision and our goal is about early intervention with young people, school aged. Primarily, currently within secondary within secondary schools, um, but our hope is that that will obviously will grow into primary age schools. But it's absolutely imperative that that there is early intervention and that there is um, provision put into place for young people to really focus and support their mental health at whatever level. And and we are that that is our our goal is early intervention. And Working what key messages, time. Lindsay, if I may, sorry to interrupt you, what, what key messages, when Isla Lissa goes to the schools, what, what are the key messages in your campaign? 
Absolutely, the, the communication is key. So whether that is communication with your peers, with your family, with with teachers, with you know other support systems, communication is absolutely key. So really being able and feeling able to say, do you know what, I'm not okay. I'm not okay today and I'm struggling and I need some help on whatever level that is. So communication is absolutely imperative. Um, really about what Ross said just before about listening to your emotions and your feelings. So really having that awareness and validating when you're not feeling okay. So really listening to your body, really listening to your thoughts and feelings is absolutely crucial. Um, And things about like keeping a routine, like, like Robin said, that is really important. It's to have that routine, but ensure that there's a bit of flexibility and that don't be very rigid to the point where you're sort of almost um, putting barriers in place. So keep a routine as much as possible, but allow that flexibility um, so they're sort of our real key, our key messages. So it's very much about communication. It's very much about listening to your own feelings and validating them and those around you and about keeping a routine where possible, but allowing that flexibility. If, Professor Davison, you, you find yourself down during self-isolation, how easy can it be to sort of slip into that mindset that you are alone? Oh, it, it can be very easy, and I draw the distinction between loneliness and uh, self-isolation. Loneliness is that that place when you feel that there's no one there, there's no one to talk to, that you're isolated not only geographically but mentally, uh, and then it's very easy to slip into uh, depression. Uh, I actually think that all the data we've got now has shown that that People who are particularly vulnerable to that are obviously people who have had a pre-existing mental health condition, but also younger people, paradoxically, between the ages of uh, uh, 15, maybe and 30, and particularly women. Uh, And study after study after study has shown us that young, particularly young women, are finding it particularly difficult and the loneliness and prone to depression as a result of lockdown. I think it's terribly important to recognise when people are slipping into depression as a result of particularly loneliness and getting into that sense of helplessness. And I I want to go back to what you said there, James, about uh, uh, how we view mental illness. I think one good thing that's happened, there used to be the stiff upper lip, the resilience, everybody, you know, just first step forward and so on. I think people are talking about it more. There was a tendency years ago to maybe rely on antidepressants and all of these sorts of things and so on. Now people are realising that actually opening up about personal insecurities, about our own problems, actually works. You know, a, a problem shared, I know it's an old fashioned thing to say, but a problem shared is a problem, maybe not half, but is a problem reduced. So I think I'm a bit more optimistic than some others about the fact that we are now opening up about our own vulnerabilities. As Ross said, men are able more, more able now to talk about issues like this. Uh, so the, the, the field is improving. We're not relying on drugs and we're not relying on on all that. We are being more open about our mental health and I think that can only be important. Some moods are are low right now, of course they are, but but even in normal times, however you define that, aren't variations in moods part of their normal day-to-day practice, aren't they? I, absolutely, and I think we've we've always got to be careful. I I use the term we not we mustn't pathologize ordinary moods. We mustn't suddenly turn sadness into clinical depression, and we mustn't suddenly turn stressed out into an anxiety state. There's a danger of turning ordinary moods that we all suffer and we're variable and everybody gets sad, everybody gets a bit tense, everybody gets scared, everybody gets lonely. These are normal conditions and we mustn't pathologise them and make them into a mental illness or a mental health issue. I think it's important to draw that distinction that the the very nature of the human condition is that we must feel sad sometimes. 
how we define resilience is not stopping us feel sad or stopping us feeling depressed. It's how soon that we can kick back out of that state. That's what resilience means. How, how at this time, how are you as a charity, uh, either Professor Davidson or, or Lindsay, how are you offering emotional support to, to family, to friends, to co-workers who have been quarantined? So um, currently at the moment, we're still offering um, support, um, as we always have. Obviously, we can't do that face to face at the moment because of the government restrictions. Um, but we are offering um, video calls um, via, via Zoom or, or Microsoft Teams. Um, we're doing telephone calls um, to clients. So that is still ongoing. So we've still got that, um, that connection with people. Um, so we can still, we can still do that. Um, in terms of what we would offer usually out to businesses, we're still offering training um, and support as we always would. And we've had to obviously adapt and modify um, how we how we offer support, um, but we we still are very much offering support. You know, we we welcome. You know, if people have got worries or concerns, you know, you can get in touch with us. There are a wealth of, of other services on the island who you can you, know, you can reach out to. But I think it's important that to realise that there, there is support out there for people. So obviously, our listens one of a number of charities and, and third sector organisations which provides remarkable yet yet often under acknowledged services to our community as a society um ross do, do we do we we widely appreciate just on the point that uh, professor davison's been talking about there do we widely appreciate do you think that it's that it is okay not to be okay or is there still some way to go in that i think there's still some some way to go in there i, I think you know we, we've got a, we've got a responsibility and as a mental health service of working with our colleagues to really market and, and, and promote some of the services that are up there and also enable this, the public to, and the community to make sense of them because we've got some incredible kind of pockets of amazing practice and incredible charities doing incredible work you know and but we do you know we do need to be more joined up in the way that we deliver services and, and, and you know the mental health services and government's got a responsibility um, to do that and it's something we're absolutely and extremely keen to do how, how is the service refocusing its um it's well it's refocusing on emotional well-being yeah. the i think historically the mental health services this is always going to be our core business as a statutory service we're going to be we're going to be, our major focus is on those people suffering with moderate to severe mental illnesses and mental health problems um but and i think that's been our sole focus um for, for historically what we're what we're really looking at now are those lower steps and how we can work with more preventative uh, methods and make sure that you know the, the wider community some of those more low to moderate um, mental health um, problems are receiving the support and, and treatment in a, in, a, in a timely fashion so the, our model of delivery is, is what, what we call the step care model if you like so it's if we it, it starts with step zero and goes up to step five and if you just um, bear with me a second James I'll, I'll try and explain so step zero really is that the, the, the kind of the emotional resilience that our own individual and collective responsibilities to look after our mental health much of what we've been discussing about today step one um, really is, 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 is primary care, so if that's not working, you might go and see your, your GP, you might access um, our listen, you might access another uh, a third sector charity. So when things are, are getting a little bit more, more, more challenging for you or, you, or you're struggling. Um, step two is our, um, for an example, is our community wellbeing service. So that's our, 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 some of our therapists and psychologists and OTs um, who are going to be working and do work, but, but, but that's the service we're increasing the size of, um, who are going to be embedded within um, primary care. Step three is your community mental health teams, your older persons teams, your community health teams for adults. Um, um, step four, inpatient services. And step five is, is where some people need absolute specialised, usually off-island provision, um, and that's a tiny proportion. So it really is a kind of a triangle what we've historically underinvested in, not just financially, but also in, in, in time and energy, are those lower steps, those preventative steps, and enabling people, the wider community, to access um, treatment and support uh, an early opportunity. That's our focus in addition to our core business, and that's a major shift for us. It's, I mean, I think we heard yesterday, last week alone, there were, there were 16 calls to the um, mm. emergency joint control room. 
uh, related to mental health issues. Yeah. We, we know one person attempted to take their own life. I think there were 11 calls of people making threats of suicide. Mm. What support network, and Lindsay's touched on it here, and it's a, a far wider support network, but what support network agencies are in place for these people and their loved ones when they can't wait for an appointment, when they need help now? I mean, you mentioned the 24-7 yeah, earlier, yeah. But, but it's not as simple as that, is it? Well, I think we look after, James, we look after around about 6% of the island's population on mental health services um, uh, caseload uh, at the moment. And, and that's, that's increasing um, year on year. So we're looking after around about sort of approaching 5,000 uh, uh, people at the moment and the, and the numbers are, are going up. And I think we can, as, as I alluded to earlier, um, you know, with the experience of this pandemic, we can see that continuing to happen. Um, the, 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 the crisis team, I mean, if you're experiencing profound um, um, acute mental health problems and, um, and, and, the, and there's real, real concerns in terms of, you know, the risk of harm to self or you know, risk of harm to self, then that crisis team is there, the, the, the number's there, and we're looking to make that um, a free phone number in the very near future. And that is a 24-hour, a 24-7 uh, provision. We also, out of hours, we have an approved social worker on call. We have two, um, um, two consultant psychiatrists on call. Um, so there's a, there's, a, there's a range of provision um, to, 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 to act very, very quickly. But um, what, what when a phone call's not enough? Well, the, the, the initial phone call, James, is to, is, to, is to understand what the problem is and then ensure that that person gets access to the treatment, the, 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 what we call the care pathway, mm. in the right time. So, really, so some of those treatments are available 24-7, but others aren't. Well, I think there's... there's, there's I, I'm certainly not going to sit here and defend some of the issues we've got in terms of access to, to talking therapies at the time. I wouldn't, you know, it's unacceptable. You know? But what's very clear to us is that we are doing something about it. We're, we're, we've, we've now secured the funding to do that. We're now going out to recruitment. We're looking at training therapists on Ireland and tapping into that, 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 that local talent pool so we can um, upskill and train um, accredited therapists. So, you know, by, 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 by the end of this year, we will be in an absolutely much better place. And our expectations in terms of, in terms of what we call our, our, our key outcomes is, are going to be far beyond what, what the, the, the NHS UK, UK NHS um, set as targets. So we're anticipating within the next you know, two years, potentially, um, we're, we'll be far exceeding um, the wait times that, that are currently offered by the NHS. Well, what has prompted this, I wouldn't say sea change because that would be harsh, but what has prompted this realisation that there needs to be a, a significant investment, and I'm not just talking financially mm. here, island-wide? Well, I think in the last few years, the, the you know the mental health service, um, you know, there's been a there's been a real acknowledgement and, 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 and greater understanding of the you know the the, the emotional impact and, and the, the mental health needs of our population. We're much you know much more open to speaking about it. There's much more press relation related uh, coverage of it. Um, so you know, there's a much more greater understanding of how crucial um, having access to, to, to treatment and support is. Um, so, you know, we, 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 we're really, like I said, and I'm going to repeat it, we're really, really keen that we're working with, our, with, with, with all the providers and our third sectors to make sure that people have access to, to, to the support, the right support at the right place at the right time. But Professor Davidson, any, any general findings that, you've, uh, that stand out for you over the last 12 months or so in terms of figures during and, and after and then before lockdown part two, part three? Yeah, I think, I think, as I said, uh, depression has increased from maybe 8% to 15% as lockdown has gone on. Anxiety has perhaps gone down a little. People who think about suicide, seriously think about suicide, it's called suicide ideation, that's about 3% at any one time of the population. It's a little bit higher than we think. There's some very serious studies that have gone on in lockdown and say that's jumped to almost 10%. Uh, so the idea of getting depressed over the last year and thinking about self-harm has actually increased. We think that the number of people who do actually attempt suicide has increased. We think that other things, particularly domestic violence, people who are shut, 
shut down in their own homes with no other things to do. That has increased. And one of the other things that disturbs me particularly is that we're drinking as a population, and the Isle of Man's no different, a third more than we did before lockdown. So the amount of alcohol as a coping strategy has increased dramatically in the last year, and that leads to impulsive behaviour like suicidal ideation, like domestic violence, like these these sorts of things. So I think it's a whole other area, but we've got to look very carefully at uh, alcohol use particularly, as opposed to other drugs, but alcohol use particularly as a precursor to some of the things you've been talking to Ross about. Any, uh, and I'll open this one to, to all of you really then, in, in that case, any, any tips particularly... Um hints of how to, to best get through lockdown? So I think I think for myself, uh, it's very much around trying to keep a routine like we spoke about before. So trying to keep a routine as much as possible. Um, trying to really focus on getting a good night's sleep and trying to keep that as a routine. I know that can be really difficult, but it is really important that people are trying to get sort of around eight hours sleep a night roughly or thereabouts um, really focus on um, you know trying to keep active and maybe think about new interests try to think about what really sort of sets your sets your soul going and, and think about things that are really interest you and focus on that um, and and really thinking about um, strategies for when you are feeling particularly low you are feeling perhaps particularly down or anxious and um, Think about what has worked for you in the past. So whether that's around distraction, sort of speaking to other people and keeping connected with other people. We are a human race that, that thrives on, on human connectedness. And that is really important. It's really about thinking about what has worked for you in the past and what can work for you going forward. Uh, I'll speak personally as well here. It's, it's, uh, I have three three sons and four grandchildren all living in England and I haven't seen them really since last March. And uh, I'm getting, you get a bit disheartened when you can't see your family and you're in a bubble and you're, you've are you also got the added problem of what if I get COVID? So uh, at the middle of lockdown around Christmas, I got, I got a, bit, a bit disheartened really, you know, and, and I felt myself sort of drifting not being able to see family and so on. So I kind of began to structure my life a bit more. I probably organised on a daily basis Zoom conversations with the family. I tried to read a book, you know, and let that go. And and I tried to get a bit of structure to my life because it's very easy just to drift into a kind of sort of depressed, as, as, as Ross said, anhedonia is a good word for it. So... I tried to add a bit of structure, and that's worked. That's worked. They're all coping techniques. I mean, this is something that, that you, as the head of mental health, speak a, speak a lot about, and yeah. it's fair to say. Yeah, absolutely. And I really have point people towards the It's Your Okay campaign and some of the fantastic guidance and um, support and, uh, and tips, if you like, um, that, are, that are available um, within those five, wells to wait, five ways to well-being. Um, sorry. So, I mean, I really would point um, people towards that. It's a fantastic resource. And also to highlight that, that, that James, we, we, you know, we, have an, we, have, we have an online counselling um, uh, platform that, 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 that the community's got access to. And we have Quell, um, which is our, our, our adult platform, and Couth, um, which is uh, tailored and uh, targeted for, for younger people. Um, and there you have 24 hours uh, a day, seven days a week, access to, to qualified staff that you can um, speak, speak to um, regarding your emotional well-being. You know, they're, they're qualified uh, therapists. There's chat rooms as well are online. So, that, again, that's a great resource that people are able um, to tap into. Um, but certainly echoing, you know, the, the fantastic advice that Lindsay and, 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 and Robin have given, you know, that connectivity, making sure that you connect with people. And, you know, for me, as I mentioned, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a dad of, of three kids under, under 10. My wife's a teacher. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm really, really conscious of the, of the, of the impact um, the, the, this has had on our, on our young community and our community as a whole, making sure that we're reaching out 
um, we, we, we're staying connected is, is enormously important. There's a, there's a toolbox of messages, if you like, this five ways to, to well-being, isn't mm. it? It's all on. It's all online. It is absolutely. I mean, so we, you know, the, 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 it starts off with the, 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 the connecting with people, you know, talking and listening, be there for individuals, and certainly understanding your own, um, you know, your own emotional well-being. Um, and then we move on to kind of be active. And there's, as I spoke about um, last week, there's a wealth of evidence um, that talks about the value of physical exercise um, in, in terms of people's, people's uh, emotional well-being and their mental health. It can have a profound positive impact on, on, your, on your mental health. And no, where's no better place to enjoy it than the Isle of Man? It's, um, you know, as a, as, a, as a bloke from South East London, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm only too conscious and, and still in awe of what, what, a, what a beautiful, beautiful um, a place the Isle of Man is, so we should try and enjoy it. Um, you know, keep learning, uh, you know, making sure that we, we, we do take the opportunities, you know, rediscovering old interests and embracing new experiences. As difficult as that sometimes can be, you know, it, it can be really, really stimulating and, 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 and help you emotionally. Um, give, I mean, you know, there's no better feeling than, than, than giving, is there? And, and, and making, doing something nice um, for people. And we, you know, we, we, there's, there's all sorts of, uh, um, you know, uh, evidence in terms of the impact that has on our neurons and how that makes us feel, 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 feel good. Um, and taking notice, and this is really what I've been, been trying to focus on, us being aware of our own, of our own emotional, emotional well-being and the emotional well-being um, of other people and starting those meaningful conversations with people um, is nothing more important than that. You, you've swapped, by the sounds of it, you've swapped jelly deals for queenies then, have you? I've, I'm, do you know, I've, 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 I'm, I'm partial to jelly. I'm not going to hit the stereotype. I'm not from the east end of London. Oh, okay. I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't mind it, but <laughs> I've probably eaten so much shellfish since I've been I'm yes. surprised I'm not walking sideways, oh, James. Absolutely. It's, um, yeah, the, 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 I've, I've avoided the chip cheese and gravy right, bit, okay. but, but, but the, yeah. shell, but the, the, the shellfish certainly. You're a fortunate man. Um, <laughs> obviously, we talk about well-being messages, their coping techniques. I listen, Lindsay, has a... A coping circle really doesn't it? We do so it's something that we quite often use within therapy and it's something that we have been very keen to, to a message to bring to the, the Isle of Man public is around um, how we um, how we cope and how we and uh, what we really can control within our lives and um, so the, the circle of control is a, a set of, of three interconnected circles if you'd like um, and it, it very much focuses on on what we can control on what we can influence and what we have no control over and the idea of the circle of control is very much that we 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 really try to focus as much as possible on what we what we can control and when we focus on what we can't control if we spend too much time in in thinking about things we can't control that can have a real detrimental impact to our mental health and our mental well-being we can start to feel very um, disillusioned with life um, so it, it really trying to focus on on other aspects rather than on what we can't control is really important and um, obviously there are things in life that we can influence and that's really important that we we can identify some of those things that we can influence and have an impact on we can try and make a real difference um, and that can really help with our with our well-being but i think the the actually the real important things are those things that we can control it's really about focusing on and really putting our energy into the things that we can really see make a change with and have an impact on and that can really impact in a positive way our mental health and well-being especially in in times like we're at the minute and where life can feel very much out of control uh, professor davison you, you mentioned grandchildren there i mean at the end of of all of this i suppose each and every family will have tales to regale to their, their grandchildren a different story uh, there might be unexpected success there will be those very much at the other end of the scale where personal lives and businesses have, have been decimated at a depression or debt uh, but potentially worse um serious illness what advice would you give to those people what initial advice would you give to those people at the more serious end of that scale well uh there's there's they, they talk about long covid and there's also long mental health issues with regard to covid it's not all just acute these, sometimes these aren't going to go away, the financial problems and so on. If I could give one piece of advice, and it's based on what Lindsay's just said, the very essence of mental illness is loss, I feel as learned helplessness, it's called loss of control. And if we can help people get back 
control in tiny bits of their life and build on that control, the, the very worst emotion is to feel totally helpless and that leads to clinical depression. And so I would endorse precisely what Lindsay said. If I could give one piece of advice, it's to try to gradually control those things that you can control. Critically important. The most important piece of advice I think you can have for people who are suffering from depression or indeed anxiety. R Ross, our, our modern day mental uh, and emotional health vocabulary ha has changed, has it not? Because I mean, you, you know, PTSD now, that used to be shell shock if yeah. you came back from the war on the battle strewn fields of Europe. I mean, I mean, has it always been there? It's just better understood now. Yeah, absolutely. As, you know, this isn't something that's just emerged. It's always been there. It's either called something differently or, or ignored or swept under the carpet. Um, so yeah, it's, it's always been there. I think we've got a much better understanding that we've, there's much more investment and resources in, in, in spent in, in, in research in, in terms of trying to understand it. So you know, we and that that's continuing. But we, we you know, in terms of um, anxiety, depression, and the whole gamut uh, of, of mental health problems, you know, we've got a pretty good idea of, of, of what works. Um, in terms of those moderate severe uh, mental health problems, you know, it's my my, my service's responsibility uh, to make sure that those treatments and services. Are, are there and 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 uh, you know and afforded in a, in, a, in a timely fashion. Um, but just re reiterating what you know what Robin and and um, uh, have said, you know, there's a huge amount that people can do themselves, and and, and and that's really important. And that you know that focus on controlling things that you can control is you know is, is a fantastic message. The distancing, closing of schools, workplaces. I suppose not doing the things we love, whether taking the kids to the yeah. park, going to sport, yeah. going to the theatre. Um, seeing family and friends, all this affects what we love to do. Mm. All, all this affects where we want to be and who we want to be with, and that creates social isolation. So, if there was, if we pay more attention to the the, the present moment, to changes in our own thoughts, how much of a help is that to well-being? How far can it go? Because to some people that will be enough. To others, it will presumably just be a, a tip. Yeah, yeah. I think you know the. the uh, we are inherently social creatures, aren't we? We we, we like being around other people. That, that that you know that's that gives us a sense of a sense of joy. And when that you know when access to that is to, is taken away, we, taken away, we need to adapt. So you know, engaging in regular telephone calls with people, in, engaging in in, in in Zoom calls with people, reaching out and connecting with people, you know, is is, is incredibly important. And, and 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 not to lose sight of that and not to let that slip, is 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 absolutely crucial. Professor Davison, we're just coming to the, 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 the end of the, this now, but um, what would you say has, 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 is there, has there been any particular aspect which has heartened you over the last 12 months where perhaps as a society we have, have learnt and developed and adapted from this pandemic and all the, the feelings that, that that has caused? I, as I said earlier on, I think that what has heartened me is that uh, looking at the figures, nearly 70% of people say they're coping with this huge change in their life reasonably or quite well. And that sense of the resilience of the population of the Isle of Man and the United Kingdom heartens me. I, I think the other thing which I would say is that in mental health treatment now, we use a lot of cognitive behaviour therapy and we use a lot of mindfulness. And mindfulness has become very popular as a therapy that's delivered on the Isle of Man and elsewhere. And mindfulness is teaching people to carpe diem. As you were saying, James, a second ago, is to grab the day, to understand the present, not to focus necessarily on the past, not to focus necessarily on the future. And it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of therapy and so on. But to be able to focus on the here and now, that mindfulness is now very popular as a treatment in mental health care. Uh, so what strikes me is what's happened. I think people are resilient. Uh, I think the, it's taught us to talk about things. I would never have dreamed uh, uh, doing this interview a year ago by talking about my own grandchildren. I would have talked about research and data and all of this stuff. But now I feel that because of a year of lockdown, slightly more personal about this. It's not all about science and it's not all about statistics. I, I can actually feel comfortable about relating my own story. And I think that's something positive that's come out in all of us in the last year. There are, there are many 
charities, organisations, third sector organisations who are here to help in their specialist areas. Lindsay, ju just from an R Listen perspective, um, where can people find out more? Um, so people can go onto our website, onto IRListen. I am. Um, there's a whole wealth of resources on there um, in terms of downloadable documents, um, YouTube videos and clips, hints and tips. There's, there's a whole wealth of knowledge on there. Um, there's also sort of pinpoints to other charities on the island as well. Again, there's a wealth of knowledge and experience on the Isle of Man through various other um, services, you know, the Samaritans, um, to, to name just one. Um, but there is a whole wealth of knowledge out there. And I would really urge people, you know, if you do feel like you need support, if you feel like you're not able to get that support from family and friends and you, and you need something more, please reach out, please, please speak up and, and get the support that you need. I'm sure that that is is probably something, Ross, that you would endorse. Yeah, absolutely. And and there's the you know again, I'll I'll, I'll refer back to the Are, Are You OK campaign, which also has a wealth of information and advice and and, and signpost people um, to a huge range of uh, of third sector organisations um, who can be there to to provide you know invaluable help and support. So you know I would urge people to to access that resource. Thank you. Um... The details are, have just been on, on the screen. Um, we, we could talk, but there were so many avenues we could explore here. Um, thank you for your time. Oh, um, pleasure. To, to Lindsay you. Christian, Professor Robin Davison and, uh, and Ross Bailey, very much appreciated and, and, and good, to, good to speak to you this afternoon. Uh, hopefully this webinar has been helpful, especially for those of you who are struggling mentally and or emotionally with, with this current lockdown, caring about our emotional well-being, I'm, I'm sure you agree, has, has never been been more important. Thanks for your company. Keep talking and take care of yourself. Goodbye.